Hi, everyone. So thank you for coming to this particular talk on this particular day. Um, we're going to talk about failing upwards today. And the fun part about it is um, this is, I think, still the only presentation of its sort. Um, I did a weird amount of research on the subject. And when I did this weird amount of research on the subject, I realized there are no other presentations on it. So um, here you are. <laughs> so how to rise in cybersecurity by finding and exploiting your weakness? Let's dive in, shall we? First. Who am I? That's a really good question, random person. So my name is Wes. Hi. Oh, I got waves. Oh my god, thank you. Okay, so I am currently living in Canada. I am not Canadian. Um, <laughs> I, I move around a lot, though. Uh, previously in the Netherlands, Japan, China, USA, Belgium, New Zealand. Um, I keep moving around. Um, I don't have a good reason for this. I just keep doing it. Um, so there's that. What I do. Uh, so I'm currently the Chief Information and Intelligence Officer. It's a really long set of words I gave myself. I have to type this in every time I do a survey. All those words. It's terrible. Um, I'm also a data privacy advocate. I'm a hacker professionally and personally. I also am a runner, a gamer. A, I walk around the world sometimes. And I'm also, I need to talk near the microphone. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm also a hacker in my free time. Now, what's that? Oh, don't, don't, don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. I'm going to walk around and it's just going to be awkward for everybody. Thank you, though. <laughs> um, but why am I like this? That's a good question also. So I, I like puzzles and I seek novelty. I think we all can relate to this. That's pretty much me. Also anxiety. Lots of that. Um, but before we start, before we kick into this for real, um, just want to start off with some, some basic level setting. We're going to start with the formatting today. We're going to talk about failing upwards. We're going to clarify what that means. And then I'm going to tell you my story. It's going to be story time. I'm really sorry about that. We have to suffer that pitch. Here's my pitch. Um, and we're going to set some scenery. We're going to t like understand like what the situation needs to be. And then we're going to go through the steps on how to actually fail upwards. Uh, when we're done with all that, I'm going to give you some final advice. And uh, hopefully, we're all going to be failures very soon. Um, some assumptions to, before we begin. I'm assuming that if you're here, you want to get ahead. You want to better job, a higher paying job, a higher, more responsibility, something to that effect. Um, I'm also assuming that uh, you know what kind of job you want to have and you currently don't. I'm also going to assume that you have some basic understanding of what that job actually is. Like you're not trying to break into rocket science for argument's sake. Um, I'm also assuming that you're willing to get weird about it. That you're willing to get awkward about it, get uncomfortable with it because that's kind of how it works. Um, and some disclaimers before I begin any of these words. Um, your mileage may, your mileage will vary uh, because your journey is going to be different from mine. It's just going to be weird for you. It's going to be like it was weird for me. Uh, but how it's weird is up to you. Um, and also, I see my privilege. I understand that I am cis male, certain height, certain build. That's going to affect how I succeeded or failed in this context. Um, however, the reason why I'm talking about this is because I have several friends in uh, gender and ethnic minority spa spaces that have done this too. So I've seen it work for others, which is why it's not just my story. It's actually just my example. And um, that said, a little bit of warning. This looks easy and is hard. It is actually really tricky to stick the landing on this. However, however, ideally, it's also fun. Because if you treat it like a game, then it's going to then it's going to be fun. It's going to give you that charisma and confidence to do it correctly. And that's what's going to sell it. So it's going to be hard fun, if that makes sense. Yeah. OK, cool. Now, I'm not touching cables, but I'm going to push the button. There we go. Let's start with failing upwards. What does that even mean? If you, if you just Google the term failing upwards, what you're going to get is variations of to advance in one's career despite failure. Um, that's, that's not failing upwards. That's career resilience. That's different. I mean, that's important too. Don't get me wrong, but it's not what we're talking about today. What failing upwards is is different, um, but why what, why would you fail upwards? I mean, like, first, I'm failing upwards in this context is, um, have you ever just had, like, a really, really mediocre boss? Like, a guy is like, how did you get here? You're, you're, you're almost bad at this. You're, you're, you're forgettable at best. Yeah, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get you in that space where you are that guy, where you are that person. Um, <laughs> congratulations. You're all about to be very mediocre, very successful. So, but why would you do that? Why would you choose this path instead of just working hard? Well, that's the bad news and the good news. Um, you may want to advance your career just because you want more money, you want more, want more responsibility, maybe, maybe more ownership. These are all good reasons. But why you would do it 
just in general, good employees don't usually get promoted. They just don't. I mean, maybe a pay raise, maybe some benefits, extra PTO. You're not going to get a promotion out of good work. You just won't. There's no reason for that. We're going to get to why. Um, and also, uh, if you're looking to like get a manager's job, for argument's sake, um, look up a job description for a manager. Can anyone tell me what a manager does, like practically? Like I am one, but like I'm just curious. What What do you guys think? What does a manager actually do? Skills. What are the emails? Emails, emails are good. What else? Meetings. meetings. Emails, meetings. What else? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that you could do like in this room right now and be a manager. It's like literally the. There's no technical skills to this. <laughs> yeah, there's no there's no degree for this. You know, there's I. It's like it's like Ken and and his job is beach. You know, <laughs> it's like that. So that so, how do you become a manager? You fail at it, and that's how you succeed at it. Anyway, how does it work? How does the actual mechanics of it work? We're going to go into the details of how it works mechanically, but here's a, just an overview. We're going to talk about counter signaling. Uh, we're talking about bias for action. We're going to talk about cronyism. That's the exploit in this context. Is the cronyism, and then we're going to talk about the, the uh, three out of the six principles of influence. Any social engineers in the room? Of course, you wouldn't raise your hands. Oh, there's one. There's one. Okay. There's always one. So it's usually the one, usually the one who's more or less fashionable. There we go. Um, but anyway, these are all like psychological and social situations that we literally can't escape. We are all subject to this, whether we like it or not. That's how we're wired. So that's how we're going to make it work for us. But first, how realistic is this actually? Well, here's some examples. Ten years apart. Um, Failing upwards is not just a really common side effect of the business of the business world, but it's also just like it's been around since the industrial age. It's probably been around since since time immemorial, kings and queens. Um, so suffice to say, everyone's looking for a solution because they keep having these mediocre managers. Um, <laughs> but why not why not make it work for you instead of working instead of having it work against you, right? So yeah, it's real. But here's the here's the here's the part I'm going to try to get through pretty quickly because frankly this is not why you're here. At least I hope it's not because it's a very dull life. But let's talk about how I got into this space, and it'll kind of give you context and maybe some examples you can draw back to. So, first, real quick buzz buzz through what, who I am as a child. Um, geek stuff. I basically was the AV person in my house. I wired VCRs and broke TVs. Um, and uh, game genies, game sharks. Any fans of breaking games? Yeah. There's a few of those in the room. Uh, teenage years, martial arts, more geek stuff, and also robotics and social engineering. I picked, a, I, I competed with robotics, and and uh, you're seeing some patterns here that I didn't see, by the way, because in the college years I couldn't quite figure out what to do. But so I was jailbreaking phones and writing cyberpunk novels, uh, very successful clearly. Um, and then early career, I was just I was doing basic retail and hospitality, as we all kind of have, right? And and then every job I had, it's like, hey, Wes can probably fix that. Um, and yeah, I, I did, but I never once figured out that I probably should pick up tech as a, as a field. Like, it never occurred to me for some reason. Um, yeah. So, then you actually get to the point where I actually do realize I want to do this stuff. So, I moved to China, I pick up a technical pre-sales job, kind of got my first kind of technical job. Um, and I go back and forth from, in Japan a lot. And um, I was shadow IT at every company. I was that guy, right? So, um, but at a certain point, at a certain point, that's actually I, I started to make that an actual job, and so I picked up a basic IT job, and a pattern you're gonna, if you if you've known me for like five minutes, you're gonna recognize this, and that is that um, that uh, that feeling like you you have these things that are wrong around you, and you have to no one else is fixing it, so clearly you fix it, right? Like you can't just let this be a bad situation. You gotta like manage that. So of course, as an IT person, I don't hold still. I pick up systems administration. I pick up risk management, I pick up data center management, um, data center administration, project management. I did all these crazy ass shit, pardon my language. Um, and then I burnt out. Learn out, le lesson from that is um, just a bit of advice. If you are about to burn out, it's because you're still holding on to too many things. So just let some of it go. That should help. Doesn't solve it, but it helps. So. It's the, the pattern here is basically going to be that I keep doing all this work that isn't actually my job. And then I keep getting tired. That's going to be the pattern here. So I do that again. Only this time I do it in the United States for a while. Uh, cloud systems administrator, site reliability work. Um, a little bit of infosec work. And here's where, it actually, here's where I actually got into security, is this job. 
right here, I was basically just really tired and also mediocre. I, I was like, I am unexceptional as a man, as an engineer. I'm like truly like a beige pantsuit of a man, of an engineer. You can like walk right past me and not know what I did. And so, but I'm also like tired and doing all these things I don't, I'm not supposed to. So like, hey, you know what, why don't you just, you look tired, you look tired. Why don't you just go do that web application firewall for us? Cause no one wants that. Why don't you just do that? And so that's how I got my start in security is doing the, the thing that I, was, I wasn't supposed to do. So, um, because I was not great at the main job. So that's how kind of how I broke into security. Um, so that said, here's the actual pivot that we're gonna talk about today. This is the actual important part. So, so I start off with doing some, plat so I moved to the Netherlands in 2016, no particular reason. 2016 was a good year to move away from the United States. No specific reason at all. Um, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, then at that point, I'm like, that's my actual first named role is in a uh, security engineer. And while I'm doing this job, uh, I realized that there is no security state to engineer on. There is no platform, there's no tooling, there's no services, there's nothing. So it became my job because, again, why would it be someone else's job when, you know, it could just be mine? So I build an infrastructure out of it. I build a service state out of it. I, you know, I organize the tools, I set things up. I have a lot of help because I'm a mediocre engineer, right? So um, I organize all the policies. I organize all the governance and all, I, I, I build like an entire thing and I was really happy. And then uh, the new CISO comes in and is like, hey, you look tired. <laughs> would you like a, it's like a slightly easier job where you just write the policies and do the governance on its own. And so that's how I broke into an information security officer role is again, doing work I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> and, and apparently I was better at that than the job I was actually doing. So there's a pattern here, right? And then from there, it gets really boring. This is basically once you're management, you're management, you just go to another job. It's just, just ask and you'll get another one. It's, 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 that's, that's less interesting. But I, but at that point, I'm like, I keep getting tired and doing the work of someone else and then wind up doing that job instead and then getting a job out of that job. And so I did that like three more times. I'm not a CSO anymore, actually. I think that's a different title now. But anyway, um, and then I moved to Canada. Long story short. So that's the journey. Let's talk about the actual subject matter, though. There's a, there's a story here, and the story is not actually how I, how I move around or why I'm like this. The story is I keep getting tired and getting a new job. So let's talk about that. Failing upwards, how does it actually work? Let's talk about the psychology for a second. That's probably the most interesting to me personally. Counter signaling. So when I say counter signaling, what I'm talking about is, is like, it, think, of, think of like a humble brag, right? It's like, it's like you're saying something negative to indicate a positive or something positive to indicate a negative. That's one of the key factors on this process. Um, we're, we're going to talk about how it connects as we get to the actual steps, but that's like one of the things of how it works mechanically on, on failing upwards. It's going to be a combination of this and bias for action. So um, I'm, I'm like a huge movie nerd and Bruce Willis is, I'm going to say, demigod level to me, give or take. You know, not anymore, not anymore, God, but like back in the 80s when he was like on his game. Bias for action. He is like Bruce Willis is actively bad at, at getting the job done. He like falls, he breaks stuff, he like he messes around, he like, like stuff happens in this movie that's new to action movies in the 1980s, right? Bias for action means that you're gonna be happy that he's trying, regardless whether he's successful or not. That's what we're gonna do as well. Um, cronyism though. So cronyism is a negative and it's, but we're gonna make it work for us. Cronyism in this context is the idea that it's a, it's a circle that you're not a member of, or that you are a member of and others are not. So it's exclusive. That's the point is it's exclusivity. It sucks, but we're gonna exploit it. How, how it exploits is interesting. Basically, if you, treat this like a, if you treat this like an attack surface, then it becomes a different conversation entirely. If you look at it as cronyism is a circle of trust. So circles equal trust equals bias. If you're inside the circle, you have a natural bias for something inside the circle. Um, example, if you take your friend and you take a person next to your friend, and they're like identical in every way. Let's call them twins. But one of them you like, one of them you don't. You're gonna, you're gonna naturally trust and relate to the one you like more than the one you don't, even though they are literally the same person, just, you know, one, one you know, one you don't. So if you consider it in that sense, biases are completely unconscious and we can't stop it. We can't not be biased, right? So the exploit is this. Trust is an expression of time and exposure, right? 
So what you do is you just need to you just need to have a force multiplier on either the time or the exposure or both, and that reduces the the amount that and that actually gets you inside that circle. That's it's a lot more, it's it's a little more complicated and nuanced, but that's effectively what it boils down to. But here's the part that's really interesting: is the um, they, there's a book called uh, The Six Principles of Influence. It's a very popular book for the social engineering crowd, and it's actually just a good book to read in general. But what they do is they cover like six, six ways to influence people. Reciprocity is the idea where you give, get something and you'll, and you'll want to give in return. Um, so we all go grocery shopping and we walk down the store, right? And someone's giving away granola bars or something to that effect. And you take a granola bar and uh, you do not buy it. You do not, I mean, like, there, there's, naturally there's gonna be some psychopath who like makes a conversation with this poor person who's giving out granola bars. That person's weird, right? No one's that, no one, no one like sits down and has a five minute heart to heart with the person giving away the granola bars. But what we do, even if we don't buy the granola bars, we, we at least say thank you, we look them in the eye and we make at least a, a, gen, a general gesture of, under, a general gesture of thank you. You know, unless you're a different sort of psychopath. But point is, is that you can't not respond if you're given something. You just can't. It's just na na human nature. And then social proof is another factor in this. Um, so, you know, there's always that, that, that one person who like crosses the, the street before everyone else does, and then everyone else starts to follow them. It's like that. So, uh, there's always one of those people. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about here as well as the social proof is if you get, if anyone approves, that is the approval of all. And then the last thing, and I, I really wish I could put more time on this because that would be its own talk entirely. And that's being, that's being likable. Um, if you're generally a dislikable person, this is not going to work for you. You've got to you've got to be um, you've got to work on your work on your confidence and your and your charisma to make this happen. Um, I can give tips on that, but the short version is that that's a really critical part as well. That all said, that's how it mechanically works is a combination of these uh, psychological and social factors. Um, so that said, oh by the way, um, I will give this presentation to anyone who wants it. So don't worry about taking notes. Um, there's a lot on the slide. Sorry for that. That said, let's set the scene. So when, we, when I'm talking about the, the circumstances in which you fail upwards, you're looking for two specific situations. You're looking for the energies of these two people. I told you I'm a movie nerd, here we go. We're talking about Buzz Lightyear for a start, falling with style. Um, so Buzz Lightyear, I'm not sure who remembers 1995 uh, very well, I, I personally don't. But it's, uh, he, but, like Buzz Lightyear, he like, Woody challenges him, like, you can't fly. He's like, yes, I can. And he jumps off a of bed, bounces on things, fly, you know, sails around on a swing and sticks the landing. And he says, yeah, you didn't, you didn't fly. You fell with style. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for falling with style. Bold, confident, and, in, and bold, bold, confident, and incompetent. That's, the, that's one of the energies we're channeling. Second one, Peter Gibbons from Office Space. Um, now, I have to be really clear about this. Don't do crimes. Um, I mean, like, this is a really good example, just only for the first 10 minutes. So if you really want to commit crimes, I can't help you with that. But I can tell you the first 10 minutes, though, actually, I can't help you, but just I won't. I <laughs> um, Peter Gibbons is the energy we're looking for. In the first 10 minutes, he basically goes through some life changes and then has a breakdown in the office, d stops working, breaks, drops his cubicle walls. And, they, and, the, and while everyone is getting fired, he's getting promoted. That's what we're talking about today. That's what we're talking about. That's the energies we're channeling. So that said, before we dive into this, a couple more words on this inside managers heads. Um, any managers in the room right now, by the way, I am so sorry for all of you. I'm so sorry. I had to pick on all of you. It's going to get worse. So um, and, and stop me if I'm wrong, but I believe we can all agree as managers, we do this. From the management side, there is no reason to promote an employee. Apart from morale, there's no there's no motivation. You're actively you're actively dis um, you're active you're actively like discouraged in some situations to promote people. Um, if you have an engineer who is good at their job, why would you promote them? Why would you ever want this person to leave? You wouldn't want them to be better better at another job. You want them to be really good at the one they have forever, because then you can because then you're doing your job by them doing theirs. So there's no reason to promote an employee a good employee ever. That's why you wind up getting better jobs when you move companies rather than inside one. So there's that. But I think the, the real extra thing here is that when you do get promoted, because it does happen eventually, 
when you do get promoted, it's because you have shown some sort of contrast against your current role. Now, what you're going to want to do in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, con in the context of failing upwards is we're going to want to make that contrast not just go, not just like here you are and here you want to be. We're going to make the contrast higher by dropping down where you are. So it's going to, we're, going to ex we're going to expand the contrast zone, which is going to make it more obvious. So better value elsewhere with higher contrast is what we're going to angle towards in the process. That said, last thing, I promise, a few prerequisites, and then we're good. <laughs> nice to have, should have, need to have. Nice to have some experience on what, on, on what you're actually trying to do. If you're trying to be a, a, like a, a knock engineer, if you're trying to be a manager, ideally you have some experience that predates that your attempt. That's nice to have. Should have at least some background knowledge of the job you're trying to reach for. And you should, but you need to have a, a, a goal state at all. If you just want a better job, this is gonna not, this is not gonna work for you. You actually have to have an active goal you're trying to reach. Um, but you, a nice to have is a startup mentality. So if, you, if you're one of those people who just like rise and grind, you know, get this bread, is that still the thing people say? I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that, that's cringe, right? Okay, anyway, that's helpful here. Um, but you should, ha should ha you should have the ability to, or the interest to work outside your hours a little bit. Um, if you work remotely, it's probably fine to do it inside your hours, but um, this is going to require more of you outside of your, outside of your normal work. Uh, but need to have, you need to be less good at your current job and, and take that risk. I'm talking about actually being mediocre in your job right now. Like, you got you to be willing to risk that. Um, but you, nice to have, though, is a friend in high places. If you have, like, a, partic a particular favorite manager of yours or some place in the knock that you're trying to reach for, as an example, then that's going to, that'll help. Um, should have, though, is acquaintances in high places. Hello. Hey. Oh, hi. Hey, hey how you doing? Doing good. Uh, for everybody who ha doesn't know this already, we have this thing called outrageous speak requests. Uh, <laughs> when you apply to speak at Bayside's, there's a little field down at the bottom that says, do you have any other outrageous requests? Whatever you put in that field, we try to provide for you, even if we have to evil genie it a little bit sometimes. Yeah. But uh, I had a request for tacky Vegas memorabilia. <laughs> so we have a, oh, that is so like, tacky. a very tacky shot glass. Oh, that's horrible. I love it. Uh, I have a, uh, a slot machine pen. Oh, my God. That's amazing. And I have a pair of socks that you should I probably actually... put on before you go anywhere else. But it says, you know, it brings oh. me to the casino. Oh my God, that's thing. amazing. So that is, thank you. Oh my God, thank no, you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic. <laughs> oh, I, I am, I am, you're the one who, you're the, you, you're the one, you brought me that poster last. Yes. Time. Oh, yep. I, I was looking forward to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. This is so tacky. Thank you. I'm going to put this in a place of honor right here. And I'll put these over here. Thank you. Tacky, but delightfully unrefined. Oh, my God. I love these sides. Um, <laughs> that is truly tacky. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, it's nice to have acquaintances in high places. Um, that's, that's not, that should have. You should at least have an acquaintance. They should know who you are, at least, right? But you need to have a high place to start off. And what I mean by that, if you're a, if you're a consultant or a contractor, and y y this won't work for you because your company is over there, you know? You gotta have a, a, an inner circle in, inside your company that you're trying to reach at all, right? So that's, that's the prerequisites we're working towards. That all said, here's the steps, because that's actually why you're here. <laughs> um, once you actually define your next step, and I'm just gonna use the example of management for the sake of ease. Um, let's assume you're, you're all gonna be managers tomorrow. This is how you go, go about it. Once you define what that next job is you're trying to reach for, you gotta power down. This is where you become mediocre yourself. I mean, like, meet your jobs KPIs. Don't risk your com don't risk your job over this, right? But you need to start powering down. You got to start looking at this. Like, I gotta like, I think quiet quit is a word people are saying now. And that's that's not quite that that that's basically what we're trying to do effectively. You need to power down. It's okay. Don't lose your job over it. Just be mediocre at it. Um, and then the next thing is you're going to want to immerse yourself in the culture of the next job you're trying to reach. Now, what is that? Now, an example of this would be like, let's say management for argument's sake. Um, you, you want to like go to meetups or hang out with managers in general. You want to like get the, use their words, like get their, there is a culture for every job. This is where you like become a member of that culture, at least in, at least in a pretending sort of way, at minimum. Uh, cause that's going to give you the wording and the, and the approach and kind of get inside their head a little bit. 
And then you're gonna train yourself to be more likable. Now I have some resources I like to use. Uh, one of them is actually is a great YouTube channel called Charisma On Command, I think. And they use like, uh, like celebrities and pop culture references to illustrate the principles of how to influence and how to, and how to be popular and how to be you know, charismatic. And um, that's what you wanna do. You wanna start working on that charisma, you know, any sort of self-help books, here's the moment. And phase one is gonna take a little bit of time, but it's actually probably the easiest part of this process. It's not too bad. Uh, but the goal of phase one is you're employable, but not a rising star yet. You know, it's, you're not great, but you're not bad. But also while you're, while you're actively okay, you're also in the process of becoming really good in the mindset, at least, of the job you're trying to reach. Phase two is starting with this, this is, this, this is fast forward about a few weeks, maybe a few months, depending on your process, depending on your, depending on where you're at. Uh, you're going to quietly start doing the next things work. Now, if it's management, you can do something innocuous, like helping them, help, helping them like format a, format tables, you know, whatever, help, helping them send emails, right? You know, just kind of pick up those little tasks that managers probably hate to do and they're happy for someone else to do. And, but, but here's the thing, you can't be loud about it. You gotta be really like, just be chill. Here's where you chill because it's gonna come to you back in a moment in phase three. But right here is where you quietly do the next step without permission. It's important you don't have permission. <laughs> it actually is. Um, and part two is you gotta make yourself familiar with the next steps, peer group and their management. So what I mean by that, here's where you, now is where you actually start, you know, kind of like introducing yourself, talking to these people, getting them to know you. You know, it's not important that they like, you don't have to, you don't have to go fishing with them. You don't have to like go to the club with them, but you have to at least, they have to at least know who you are. That's the hope, right? So that's the intention. And then you got And then at that point, once you got steps one and two, then you, then you got to begin doing more of the, more of the next step. Just, just start phasing it into your rotation. Just start doing this habitually and make it normal. Make it super normal that this is something you do now. It's like, why are you in the knock? You don't work here. Yeah shrug and like walk away like don't make a deal of it the goal of this is that you just seem to be doing it better at this other job that isn't yours <laughs> right from the stories i told earlier here's here's where here's where here's where the lessons are so phase three this is again maybe a month six months it depends on how it depends on everything it depends on all the variables in your in your circle but once you have convinced yourself and others, and it's important you have all that confidence in yourself and everyone does too. Everyone knows this is just something you do. You just do this, it's fine. Invite yourself or shadow, or shadow someone into the conversations and meetings that you don't belong. I mean, like just, again, be chill, be cool, just make it normal. Make it normal, just follow a manager into the management meeting, if, as an example, right? And doing this will, this is where, the, this is where that's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This is where the uh, uh, social proof comes in. Because here's the trick. Once you're in a room and no one tells you, no one, no one objects, you officially have permission of everybody. You officially do. You're in the circle if no one objects. It just happens. And then at that point, begin doing less and less of your current job and more and more of the one you're about to do. And this is where you actually start failing your KPIs. This is where they, you stop doing your job well and you start doing another job better. I mean, like actively, visibly. Because at step three, here's where you actually, once you've gotten into that circle of trust, here's where you express your intent to move into that role. And at this point, it's gonna be an interesting situation for you because this is the point of no return. One of two things is gonna happen. Either they're, either they're going to talk amongst themselves, either the circle is going to consult the circle, or the circle is gonna consult HR. Or they're gonna tell you to go to HR. If HR gets involved, you, you push too fast because they should talk to each other first. If they, talk to, if they tell you to go to HR, then, you, then you, you've gone through phase two too quickly. So you gotta, yeah, phase two builds on, phase, phase two is a requirement for this. But then for step four, here's where it gets interesting because whether they accept, whether they deny, regardless what the circumstance is, once you've expressed that intent, the next thing is you wait a little bit and then you update your resume, you update your LinkedIn, you put on your LinkedIn profile all the things that you've been doing. That is not your job. Do it, who's gonna stop you? There's no LinkedIn police. This is not fraud. Well, it might be, depending on the job. Don't say you're a lawyer. I've seen that. I've seen suits. Don't do that either. Don't do crimes. Don't do crimes. Um, but anyway, so like, put yourself out there as this new person. Make it clear. And then at that point, 
whether if they come back to you with a, with the, with the job, perfect. If they don't, perfect. <laughs> because at that point, stay or go becomes the next choice. I think we've all been in that position. Hopefully, maybe less than some. Um, but the goal here for phase th phase three is you're better at in this other work and you will do it. You will do it whether you're here or there, but you're gonna do this job now, you've done it. Phase three is where you actually change into that person you've been trying to get to the whole time. You just don't ask permission, that's the key. And you, know, and you notice in phase three is where you talk about it because phase one, it needs to be normal. You gotta normalize the job you want to have. That's what's gonna give everybody the understanding that you should just have the job, right? So, that all said, summing up, how are we doing on time? Oh, fantastic, so much time. Oh, I am so happy. Okay, to sum up, failing upwards is really commonplace. It might as well work for you. I mean, this is literally happening every day. We can't stop it. We might as well use it, right? Um, it's a combination of normal human behavior. When I say normal human behavior, I mean normal human, not normal behavior. Because this is an abnormal thing we shouldn't do, but we're gonna exploit it anyway and be successful at it. And to fail up, you have to be employably mediocre. You have to be, like, you can't be good. You've got to be mediocre at best, properly unexceptional, and then quietly achieve in a different space you're trying to reach, and that's what's going to make the shift happen for you. And then I have to be glib. Don't come in on Saturday and fall with style. So that's, that. I'm sorry. I had to, I had to do some stupid joke at the end. Um, and that's the summing up of it. Now, I told you I'm going to send this presentation to whoever wants it because there's a few resources. <laughs> so... There is a lot to take in on this. Um, I did a lot of research on this. The, the, the two articles I gave at the beginning, they're here. Um, but I think just some quick call outs, um, just to kind of channel the energies you're looking for. Again, we're looking for like um, the Social Engineering Village uh, has their own YouTube channel if you catch up on the talks. Charisma on Command is a good resource for building that, building that confidence and the ability to talk and small talk. Like the, the obnoxious things we all have to do, why not be good at it? Stuff like that. Um, if you want to follow some social engineers like Alith Denise, I think she currently, uh, yeah, I think she's, she's actually, I think she's, I think she's actually here today. Um, Rachel Toback is another really good choice as well. Um, and reading books is one of those things. It's like, we all say we read books. Some of us do, but we all say we do. Here's where you actually books you should read. I recommend specifically influence the psychology of persuasion. Uh, this is the Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's the one who wrote the six principles of influence. He did it from marketing. Uh, which feels gross, but it is actually a really good book on how to develop those interpersonal skills that's going to give you that, the, that edge, right? Um, and then also, I think maybe, maybe my favorite book I've read has got to be Joe Navarro's What Everybody Is Saying, What Everybody Is Saying, an ex-FBI's an ex guide to speed reading people. Uh, we're talking about things like the direction people's feet tell you whether you should talk to them or not. Stuff like that. It's crazy. I love it. Um, Social Engineering Village, if you're going to DEF CON, please, please hit these guys up. Um, and then, yeah, my LinkedIn is the bottom there. It's, uh, yeah, so you can, you can, it's a poorly tended garden. I probably, I will accept it and then probably like not look at it for weeks, but I will get back to you, promise. Um, that all said, we actually have a lot of time for questions because I was weirdly quick today. So, oh, thank God there's questions, yes. Oh, microphone. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask the question again. Um, so you you talked a lot about it being important to be mediocre in your current job. Can you speak yeah. more to why that's important? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think um, somewhere in the somewhere I think slide five or six I mentioned briefly, very briefly, that uh, you're looking for contrast. The reason why you're looking for contrast on that is is because the you basically, it's not enough to just be better at another job in most cases, because again, it's, you're not gonna get as much visibility doing it that way. Being mediocre at the other job is gonna give you that push. So it's a pull and push effect. Um, so I think that's, I think it's a combination of higher contrast and a push and pull on the process. Yeah. Hi. Um, there he is. Yay. Hey. Um, so I, cut, I love this presentation because I kind of accidentally did all that at nice. my previous job. Um, so. That's social proof that he's right. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> excellent, uh, excellent. Um, so the one thing that I had trouble with in a previous attempt to do this was doing something where it, it just didn't exist. There was no social circle. 
at all? Like, how do you do this where the company has no impetus, no people, mm. no circle for the thing that I want to do? Oh, see, that's the exciting part. If you're in that situation, you got to you got to pivot a little bit, and you got to there, there's there's a circle somewhere you have to impress. It's if it's if it's if you're trying to go like le like into a different space and not the one you're entering, you have to build the space yourself. Then it's probably you probably just want to swap the circle for management. Just like just make make it about management and then just like start doing the job. Yeah, good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh yes, hello. Excuse me. How does how does your falling upwards compare to the Peter Principle? Because it seems like a bit of an expansion of it. So, sorry, can you one more time, please? Uh, the Peter Principle was a book published in 1969. Oh, shit. That about people rising to their highest level mm. uh, possible, and then a bit more due to incompetence, and that's where they tend to stick. Yeah, honestly, it is. It is very much an expansion of that. You're right. Um, no, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. No, I think the the interesting thing about it is that it is that um, this this process doesn't work very well in um, e in properly egalitarian societies. For example, if you do this in Denmark, it won't succeed. Uh, it has to be like a late stage capitalist Reagan Reaganomics sort of situation. You, you have to, you have to. I mean, greed has to be part of this, or else it doesn't fit for some reason. Yeah, it's it's weird, but you're right. Absolutely, it's very. It's basically an expansion. Good point. Yeah, you sir. Would you consider attending besides LV a phase three activity? And if so, what are some of the actions or activities some of the people in this room might be able to do while they're here? I am so sorry. I did not quite catch all that. One one more time. <clears throat> Would you consider attending B-Sides LV a phase three activity? Oh. And if so, what are some of the actions or activities that Ooh. some of the people in this room could do while they're here? Yes, okay, thank you, sorry for that. Um, yeah, good point. Let's go back to phase three real quick. Just, just for visual reference, right? Okay, so actually, I would, I would consider, consider B-Sides probably more of a phase one situation. Because at this point, it's phase one, step two. This is where it's going to be immersing yourself in the next steps culture. So, um, however, however, um, I know that there's some people hiring out there. So you could just bridge the gap, you know? So it's entirely possible to do both. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hey, how's it going? I really love the presentation. Oh, I just wanted to ask if there are any tips for high-functioning perfectionists that find it difficult to be mediocre. Oh my God, my people, my people. Yeah, um, actually, unironically, I actually have a tip for that. Um, yeah, just express that, express that anxiety in the new job. Just pivot, focus, focus the perfectionism on the thing you're trying to achieve. And then at that point, you'll probably be too busy to, to be good at your job. <laughs> Do you want to take one more before oh, let's, we let, yeah, transition? Let's oh, I'm, I'm good. Just, um, I have to stop sometime, right? <laughs> Drake, how many more minutes till we transition? 10? Okay. Oh, fantastic. Right. Let's keep this going. Yeah. Who's next? Ah, oh, there he is. I'm just curious, how, how have your tactics changed now that everybody's gone remote? Because being in person, it was a lot easier to just kind of stroll in behind mm -hmm. somebody to the meeting. Now we have to get the invite. Yeah, that is actually a really good point. Um, so, <clears throat> so if I got, let me just repeat the question, make sure I got it right. How does the remote side of it factor in? Okay, yeah, uh, that's it's actually in a way easier in some ways because you can basically just like piggyback on a, on a, on a Zoom link, you know. I mean, the thing is, unless it's actually like a properly locked down virtual meeting, you can just show up to them. I mean, if you if you if you I'm not going to name brands, but there's a lot of brands where it's like you can literally just like find the link if you're willing to scrape and like you can even like not even get permission into these meetings. That's not a thing. That's not formal advice. I'm not going to give you advice to do crimes. Here's here's me not advising crime, but you could totally do that. Um, but like that aside, though, um, socially, though, that's where it gets interesting, because how do you establish a rapport virtually? Right. A um, couple tips. That I found were really helpful is um, everyone does this thing, and I think we're all guilty of this. Where we're in a virtual meeting, and we all like we're all like like we can see up up each other's nose because the webcam is down here, you know, or we or we're like square on, like we're like we're like like this, and like you see like we're square shoulders, and it's it's 
it's a weird psychology, but if you actually pivot slightly to the side, put one shoulder back and just kind of relax into it a little, then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna feel more confident because you're more comfortable, and you're gonna and you're gonna look more confident because you are because you clearly feel comfortable. So just be more comfortable on camera. That'll help. If there's if you're in a company that is like no webcams, you got you got another, another set of challenges there, and I can't help with that. <laughs> All right, Ops gave us two more questions, and then our next panel is ready All to fine. roll through. I already told this person they could go next. So. Yeah. Where do you tend to find most people fail in the process? What step along the way? I'm sorry, one more time? Where do you tend to find most people fail in the process? What step oh. is the most difficult for people to overcome? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, re I relate to this gentleman here with a fashionable beard. Um, you could be a social engineer with that beard, by the way. Um, so, um, I re so that is actually, um, I relate to his struggle specifically because I don't like failing. I don't like um, making mistakes. I really don't like being mediocre. I mean, it's, it's, I, I just, my mother would be disappointed in me, right? So I can't, I can't handle that emotionally. Uh, that is usually the hard part for most, is the idea that you have to just be, just be not good to be better. It's very counterintuitive. Um, so if you, it's one of those things, that's where it's gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be at peace with that. And that's, that's easily the hardest part. There's no specific failure in the process it's just that mindset that's a challenge yeah can i see the hand of someone who hasn't already asked a question i will be here and talk to you by the way okay. so our, our next, our next panel away. that i might be on is ready to set up yeah how do you feel linkedin falls into all of this how does linkedin factor in well good question um it's a, it's amazing what it's amazing what you can get away with on linkedin um it truly is are you uh, are you aware by the way just a, just a pro tip uh, GitHub has repositories of all the answers for all the quizzes. So you know those little like knowledge quizzes? You can actually like go to GitHub and find the answer sheets for them. So, you know, there's that. Um, so don't trust those quizzes, but they sure look good to HR, don't they? Um, no, the, the thing is, is that it's really just about self-promotion and the way, the way this works so well, the reason why it's so successful for people, other people like, I suppose like me, is that, um, is that it's it's um it, it's it's a quiet it's a quiet sort of promotion of itself. It's like it's like it's not it's more like you get to talk about yourself, but you don't get to brag. It's just it's just a statement of fact. It's like well, it's like, let's talk about GitHub, right? Same story. If you have a GitHub repository, that's street cred, right? So it's like that. It's like quietly promoting yourself without actually promoting yourself. And so in that sense, that's exactly what we got to do because the, the whole point is normalizing the job you want to have, right? So if you put so if you just like say what you're say what the job that you clearly have skills and abilities to do and you put that on linkedin that just establishes you to the public that this is who you are so yeah and i'm i guess they're going to take my microphone away at some point um they still do they still have those hooks by the way from those old-timey shows oh five minutes oh sweet stage cane is that what they called it's actually got a name it's called a stage cane i learned something today oh okay I learned something today. Thank you. God, B-Sides is so informative. Yeah, we, we're going to start setting up. Okay, so I guess I'm going now. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just uh, hit me up after this. I'm going to be carrying around some socks and some stuff. Uh, thank you.